welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, hey, listen. I'm going to go before the Lord. I'm going to get uh, on my knees in prayer. So if, you, if you're able to stand, would you join me as we go before the Lord in prayer and reverence? Father God, we come before you today, and we're just grateful, Father, as we continue this attitude of thanksgiving this Thanksgiving week. Lord, we're just thankful that we have a place to come for the, to the house of the Lord. Father, we're thankful that we can come into the house of the Lord to freely worship you, to freely hear you. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man, to hear from a woman. Lord, we don't come to church for entertainment. God, we come into this place to hear from you, and we fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of this church. So it's in the name of Jesus that we ask that the Holy Spirit would minister to us today to speak to us. Father, I ask that your Holy Spirit would help us to open our eyes to see and our ears to hear your word as we would hear it today. God, I thank you that it would be a seed planted on the good ground in our hearts, and Father, that we would leave this place and bear much fruit and do much work for the kingdom of God in our lives and in our families. Father, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers in the body of Christ, the Lord, the same blessing that we ask upon ourselves. Father, we ask that you would bestow that upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ all throughout the world and in the the Inland Empire. Father, we thank you for our Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters, our Catholic brothers and sisters, our Methodist, Episcopalian, and Presbyterian, and Baptist, and Lutheran brothers and sisters. Father, we thank you for all the churches all across the Inland Empire that are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We lift up the Way World Outreach to you. We lift up Emmanuel Baptist. Father, we lift up Ecclesia Christian and Inland Christian. Father, we thank you that you set your hand upon uh, Harvest Christian Fellowship, Father, on the the Grove, on, on Sandals Church, on Abundant Living, Father, on Oak Valley, on Crossroads, all the churches all across the world. Father, we don't see ourselves as better than anybody else, but we do see ourselves as brothers and sisters, as co-laborers in the body of Christ, all working together to serve in the ministry to build the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we give you, Father, the praise and the glory and the honor for all that you will accomplish in your church today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, as you're seated, why don't you go ahead and grab your Bibles and open them up to Hebrews as we continue our study. in Hebrews in the fifth chapter, for those of you who are just joining us on Sunday mornings, the weekend mornings, I should say, we, we continue and we go through the Bible line upon line, precept upon precept. What that means is the Bible was written that way, so we're going to study it that way. And we've been continuing in our study of Hebrews, going through it with a fine-tooth comb, so to speak. I mean, taking our time and just enjoying what the Word of the Lord has to say. Last week, we took a short break while we had Harry and Cheryl Salem. I tell you, it was, a, it was an amazing service. What a wonderful message about blessing. You should grab a hold of that. Uh, you can check it out online if you, if you go online to, to watch that if you didn't catch it. What a wonderful message. I'll tell you what. Did you guys enjoy Harry and Cheryl last week? Well, today we pick up and we resume our, our thoughts on Hebrews in the, in the fifth chapter. Pastor Jim, two weeks ago, brought a message called The Asking Prayer, talking about Jesus Christ. And we're going to resume with that thought. Uh, Today in Hebrews in the 5th chapter. Let's go to Hebrews in the 5th chapter where we resume our studies. In the 7th verse, Hebrews 5, 7, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, capital H, his flesh, speaking about Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, we're talking about him, our great high priest. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him, God, who was able to save him, Jesus, from death and was heard because of his godly fear. So here we're seeing, we're reading about Jesus Christ, our great high priest, our great representative, the final high priest that we have, who in the time that he existed as a man here on earth, during his life, he offered up to God prayers and supplications, and he was heard by God because of his godly fear. So Pastor Jim last week, or two weeks ago, talked about the asking prayer, or, or, or what to ask God for, and I want to encourage you, if you didn't grab a hold of that message, to get the CD after the service, or you can go online and you can get it or watch it for free, listen to it on your mobile device or on your computer, and I encourage you to get a hold of that, because you need to know what to ask and why to ask God for certain things, and so I encourage you to grab a hold of that. And so today we're talking about, uh, the, 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 the title of today's message is called Genuine Prayers. Because if we're to look at prayer, if we're to look at our prayer life in general, why not look, what better example to look at than Jesus Christ where the Hebrews tells us that he offered up prayers and supplications and God heard him because of his godly fear. If we're to follow any example, what better example is there for us to follow in regards to anything in our life spiritually, but essentially, especially prayer, to look at the the author and finisher of our faith, Jesus Christ. So today what I want to do is I want to take you to some places in the Bible to show you what Jesus tells us about prayer. 
And we want to look at some of the examples and some of the teachings of Jesus, the master, the, 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 the perfecter of prayer in his life, and the example for you and I to follow after. So today we're going to look at genuine prayers, because here Jesus lays out some examples about prayer and what prayer ought to be, and I'm going to take you there. And, I, and when I say genuine prayers, because I don't know if I'm the only one here. I hope maybe that I am because I hope that you guys are all more spiritual than me. But there have been times in my life where I've, I've prayed to God and my prayers have not necessarily been very genuine. For example, I might say, God, I pray that you smite that person who cut me off on the freeway today. <laughs> and you know that those prayers aren't genuine. You know that those aren't the prayers of the will of God. So today, what better example for us to learn how to pray, what to pray, what to say, and how to do it with the right attitude, the right mindset, than to look at the example of Jesus Christ and the teachings of Jesus Christ. So today, let's turn to the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew in the sixth chapter. Here, Jesus and Matthew is teaching on the mount. He's delivering his sermon, and he's teaching on, uh, on, on various things, and he begins to talk about the subject of prayer and then further on the subject of fasting. And in Matthew, the sixth chapter is the first time you'll find in the Gospels that Jesus teaches us the model prayer or the Lord's Prayer. You might, you might know or that might sound familiar to you that you, know, you might have heard it somewhere. Maybe uh, somebody was saying it or repeating it as a group. You know that our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will. You know, the Lord's Prayer. This is the first time that we see this in the gospel and Jesus is teaching how to pray and he says, when you pray or, or, or pray like this. But I'm not going to take you to the Lord's Prayer today. I'm actually going to take you to the section of scriptures just before the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer, Jesus gives us the model prayer, the ideal prayer, and what it should look like and what it should sound like. But at the same time, before that, Jesus gives us some thoughts and some insights about our prayer life. And we're talking about genuine prayers today, and so what better example to look. So why don't you go with me to Matthew in the 6th chapter. And here in Matthew in the 6th chapter, we're going to start here in verse number 5. Jesus is, is speaking to his people. And in verse number 5 of Matthew, the 6th chapter, Jesus begins and he says, And when you pray. Now before we go any further, I want to point something to your attention. I want you to pay attention to those three words, when you pray. And as we read this, just pay attention to what Jesus is saying. Verse number five, he says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Verse number six goes on to say, But you, when you pray, there it is again, there's those three words again, when you pray. But you, when you pray, Go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward openly. Now let's go on in verse number 7. It says again, and when you pray. Three times Jesus says, when you pray. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And concluding the thought, therefore, verse number 8 because of what I've just said, therefore do not be like them, for your Father knows the things which you have need before you ask them. Three times Jesus uses the words, when you pray. You and I have been taught, if you've ever been in church for any, at any amount of time here at the Rock Church, you've been taught that whenever you see the Word of God repeat itself, whenever you hear God repeat himself more than once, you ought to perk up and start listening to what he says. And here Jesus gives us the example, the three words, when you pray, and he says them three times. Therefore, we ought to sit up a little bit more in our chair and say, what is he trying to deliver to us today? And what I want to do is when I talk about genuine prayers today, I want to take you to these three thoughts, and I want to shed some light on them. I want to dig a little bit deeper, go a little bit deeper into some thoughts of what Jesus was saying about these three things that he was talking about using the examples of what you should not do and an example of what you should do. So today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about when you pray, looking at what Jesus said here in Matthew, the sixth chapter. So if you have a ribbon or if you have a, a bookmark in your Bible, I want to encourage you to put it there because we're going we're to go and we're going to come back and we're going to go and we're going to come back to Matthew. So I want to encourage you to, to, to mark that place in your Bible. And let's talk about this morning when you pray. Number one for this morning out of Matthew, the sixth chapter. When you pray, number one, pray with humility. Jesus tells us, when you pray, do not pray like the hypocrites. And what I want to show you is in Matthew, the, the sixth chapter and the fifth verse, here Jesus says, when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. 
seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they will have the reward. So today, number one, when you pray, pray with humility. Now, you remember this word humility a few weeks ago. We were talking about the battle between pride and humility. Was anybody here? Well, we talked for the few weeks about battle of pride and humility. You may recall the definitions that we had with pride and humility. Humility was God exaltation. Pride was self-exaltation. And here Jesus comes and he says, and when you pray, pray with a sense of God exaltation. And he lays out the, the example using the, the Pharisees and the religious leaders. And this, he would say that they would pray on the street corners for everybody to see so that they would say, wow, look how righteous, look how holy that person is. And, and he would use the example and he says, when you pray, come before God with humility. You see, prayer is a gift given to us. God desires a relationship with us. Prayer is the means by which you and I communicate to God and God communicates to us. It is a gift by God. It is a tool given to us from God. And God's desire when we go before the Lord in prayer is to come to before God with a humble heart, a heart of, self -ex or of, of God exaltation. You see further on in Matthew the 6th chapter as Jesus is teaching us the model prayer, he says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Before he even gets into all the different areas of necessity, all the different areas of need, all the different areas of forgiveness and things of that nature, right off the bat, he starts the prayer off with an attitude of humility, saying, God, your will be done. Your kingdom come in my life. We ought to go before God with a sense of humility, not a sense of, of self-exaltation. God, I want to remind you how good I've been. God, I want to remind you as I go before you in prayer today that I have lived all my life to serve you. God, I want to remind you as I look at my bank account and I pray over my finances today that I am a tither. God, I want to remind you of all the good that I have done. I have given to the poor. God, help me. Because what you're doing in that sense is you're bringing up a self-exaltation. You're rising, you're, you're, you're lifting yourself up. But God desires you and I to come and say, God, your kingdom come. God, your will be done. God, I come with a, a sense of God exaltation. It's not about me. God, it's not about my achievements. God, it's not about how good I look. God, it's about how good you look. And God, I come with a humble heart. What the humble heart signifies that God, I let you be in control of my life. And when we go before the Lord, we ought to go with a heart of humility, with a lifestyle and an attitude of humility because that's the sign that we have relinquished control of our lives to God and we have submit to God and his kingdom and his will in our lives. But let me, let's not just take Matthew the 6th chapter. Let's look at another thought of Jesus. Why don't you turn with me to the book of Luke in the 18th chapter. Luke in the 18th chapter, here Jesus is teaching on prayer. And he gives us a parable, a parable being a visual illustration. In Luke, the 18th chapter, Jesus is teaching us a little bit more on prayer. And I want to point some things out to you. Luke, the 18th chapter, in the 9th verse. Luke, the 18th chapter, in the 9th verse. We'll put it up on the overhead, but I want to encourage you to bring your Bible. Don't just take my word for it. Don't just take Pastor Jim's word for it. Read it in your word. Luke, the 18th chapter, in the 9th verse, Jesus starts off and it says, or the, 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 it gives us a little bit of background, and it says, also he spoke this parable to some. Who is this some? Who trusted in themselves, interesting, that they were righteous and despised others. So right off the bat, we see that Jesus, before he even starts to tell the parable, we tell, the, the, the author tells us, Luke tells us, hey, listen, Jesus is telling this to the people that are self-righteous, that are self-exalting, that are praying in a sense of pride rather than in a sense of humility. And he gives us the example, and now Jesus begins to teach us a little bit more about prayer, speaking to the people who are praying with pride. And he says, two men went up to the temple to pray, verse number 10. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. A Pharisee being the religious leader of the day and a tax collector being one despised by almost everybody. Verse number 11, the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, verse number 12. I give tithes of all that I possess. So right off the bat, the prayer of the Pharisee, the prayer of this religious leader is, God, oh, I want to remind you, I thank you, Lord, that I am a good and righteous man. God, I thank you that I am better than everybody else. God, I thank you that as a Christian, you have made me the head and not the tail, and I am above everybody else around me. And he's praying with a sense of pride, a sense of self-exaltation. 
And Jesus is making light and shedding light on this. And look what he goes on to say. Verse number 13. He changes it now to the other side and he says, And the tax collector stood afar, standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven. Here's the tax collector, somebody despised by man. Wouldn't even come near to the place. He stood afar off. The Bible says that he wouldn't even raise his eyes to heaven, would kept his head down, would not raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus goes on to say in verse number 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who humbles himself, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. When we go before the Lord in our prayer, in our prayer lives, our attitude of prayer should be humility. God, it's not about you or it's not about me. It's not about my will. It's not about my success. It's not about my money. It's not about all these things that I want to have in my own selfish desires. But God, it's about your kingdom come. God, it's about your will be done. God, I pray that you be in my life. God, that I pray that I would be used by you so that I could be a vessel for you today. And when we come with a sense of humility... We can be assured that, we, we, that God hears our prayers because we have a sense of a genuine prayer. Number two out of Matthew. Are you with me still this morning? Matthew, let's go back to Matthew in the sixth chapter. Number two. Out of Matthew in the sixth chapter, looking at the second example, number two in the sixth verse, Matthew 6, 6. Jesus says, but when you pray, go into your room. And when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Number two this morning, when you pray, pray with genuine intentions. Pray with genuine intentions. Here Jesus is delivering the, the antithesis or the opposite uh, illustration here of the Pharisee. And he says, when you pray, the Pharisee likes to stand on the corner. The Pharisee likes to stand in public and make everybody see how well he prays. But he says, but when you pray, you go into the secret place. You go into the closet. The, the, we call that the prayer closet. You go into the place. And what happens here is what you're doing. Why does genuine intentions in praying secretly have this to do with the same thing? Well, here, let me show you. When you go into the secret place, when you shed the public opinion, Appearance. When you're not worried about what people are, are hearing your prayers, when it's just you and God, you shed all the distractions and all, the, uh, all the, the different vanities that you might throw into a prayer, and now it's between you and God. You see, God desires an intimate relationship with you. God does not want a distant relationship with each and one of us where we're down here and he's God up there, the man upstairs, but rather God wants to have an intimate, loving relationship with each and every one of us. And when, when it comes to intimacy, you can be no more intimate than to be genuine in a relationship. And God wants you, he desires that you and I come to him with genuine intentions, to come to him with, with a, a heartfelt intentions to say, God, it's not about my will, but rather yours be done. God, I may want these things. God, I may desire these things. God, they may be the, the, the wants and desires of my heart. But Lord, the fact of the matter is, is that because I come to you in humility, I come to you with genuine intentions. And God, in the secret place, I want your will to be done. A few weeks ago, as Pastor Jim talked about the asking prayer, some, one of the things that we should ask God for, we talked about, was wisdom. God came to Solomon uh, the son of David, the, the great king of Israel. God came to Solomon as he was a young man and, and, and asked Solomon, Solomon, what is it that you want from me? And Solomon asked God for wisdom. So we, we, we kind of heard this before, but I want to take you back there. If you've got your Bibles, remember, keep that marker there in Matthew. But let's go to the book of 1 Kings in the third chapter. 1 Kings in the third chapter. Here God is asking Solomon, what is it that you want from, from me? Ask First King, the third chapter, and we know that Solomon asked wisdom. We know that Solomon was known throughout the land as the wisest. Solomon was a great and mighty king. He expanded the kingdom of Israel. The people came from far and wide to hear from him and to speak to him, to know him. Uh, he built the temple. Solomon had a legacy that he lived. Solomon was the last king of Israel before Israel, the nation, was split into two halves or two kingdoms. Solomon lived a, 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 a wise life. And here, God asks Solomon in a dream, interesting, we're talking about going before God in the secret place, the most intimate place. And here God doesn't send a prophet. God could have easily sent a prophet to Solomon in the courts in front of everybody and said, Solomon, God has sent me to ask you what is it that you want of him. 
That would not have been unusual, that, not, that would have not have been uncommon, but rather God goes before Solomon in a dream while he's asleep. Why? Because nobody else is around, because there's no other distractions around. It is just God and Solomon in an intimate setting. And God says to Solomon, what is it that you want from me? And Solomon's response in 1 Kings, the third chapter, verse number 9. Therefore, give your servant. Hey, listen, let's stop right there for just a second. Solomon was a king. Everybody say king. king. Solomon was a king. Solomon lived an aristocratic life. He grew up in the high courts. Solomon had servants all of his life. Solomon had multiple homes. Solomon had nice clothes. Solomon ate what he wanted to. Solomon never went hungry. He drank everything he wanted to. Solomon had everything he needed in life and then some. So here's this man who lives uh, in, in the highest of positions amongst his people. He's, a, he, he is, he's the head of, of all the people. And here when he goes before God in this dream, in this intimate setting, before when nobody else is around, Solomon's response to God is, therefore, your servant. You see, Solomon came before God with a humble heart. God didn't, Solomon didn't come before God and say, well, you know, I'm a king. I'm Israel. This is the great nation. You put me here. So God, you've exalted me. I'm grateful for that. But rather he says, therefore, your servant. God, here I am. Nothing in your eyes, nothing compared to you. So he comes with a sense of humility, and so he says, Therefore, your servant, uh, uh, therefore, give to your servant an understanding heart to judge, listen to this, to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this great people of yours? You see, Solomon asked for wisdom, but Solomon didn't, Solomon didn't say, God, I would like to be wise. I would like to have wisdom so that I can make good business decisions. God, I ask for wisdom so that I can make smart investments. God, I ask for wisdom so that I can have strategic battle decisions. But rather, Solomon says, God, I ask for understanding so that I can be a good leader to your people. God, I ask for understanding so that I could further glorify your name. Because if your people succeed, you succeed. And so Solomon's intentions were genuine. They were not selfish. They were not self-seeking. But he said, God, let me lead because who can lead this great people of yours? Only those who you have blessed. Yeah. And look what goes on. Look what we go on to see in verse number 10. It says, the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. But look what verse number 11 says. God's response to Solomon talking about genuine intentions. Then God said to him, because you have asked this thing and have not asked long life for yourself, have not asked for riches for yourselves, nor have you asked for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. And God goes on to say, I will give it to you. You see, Solomon didn't say, God, I want to outlive everybody in my family. God, I want to live rich and, and, and prosperous. God, I want my enemies to be smited before you. God, I want to have all these different things. No, Solomon said, God, help me to lead your people by letting, allowing me to discern justice, to have an understanding heart. And because of Solomon's genuine intentions, God heard Solomon, and God gave Solomon great wisdom. As a matter of fact, immediately after this example, we begin to see the, the, uh, this story, we begin to see the exemplification of Solomon's wisdom. Right off the bat, Solomon begins to apply the wisdom that God has given to him supernaturally. Why? Because of his genuine intentions. Further on in the, in the Word of God, we see about kings who have been granted further, further stays of their life, who have been given extra years, and yet they did nothing with them. But here's Solomon's genuine intentions were, God, give me the understanding to lead your people. Our prayers as we go before God ought to be intentional, to God, ought to be a, a genuine, God, your kingdom come. God, your will be done. Lord, I know that if, I'm, if I ask for blessings, God, I don't ask for blessings for myself just so that I could be blessed. But God, I ask that if you bless me, that you bless me so that I could bless others. God, I ask that if I have blessings on my life, that people would see the glory and the goodness of God in my life. God, I pray for my family that they would know the glory of God. God, I pray that your kingdom come. God, I pray that your will be done. And all of a sudden, all in our heart, the genuine intentions come because God desires that intimate relationship with him. God desires that closeness with him, not that distant relationship. Are you with me this morning? We got one more just for this morning. I want to talk to you about one more. We're talking about when you pray. Number three, when you pray. Out of Matthew, the sixth chapter, let's go there. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Verse number seven, when you pray, do not use vain repetitions 
as the heathen do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. The last one for today. When you pray, pray with heart, not head. Pray with heart, not head. If you don't remember anything else out of today's message, if you leave this place and some of your family members ask you, how was church? And you say, oh, church was great. Oh, the message was good. Oh, yeah, what did they talk about? And you, well, I don't remember the three points. If you leave this place today, if you can't remember anything else, remember this, that God listens to the prayers of your hearts, not the words of your lips. You see, prayer is a gift. Prayer is a tool that God has given to us. Don't ever shortchange the gift that God has given to you because you're afraid or intimidated by what you sound like. Because your words aren't put together. Sometimes people take, their, take the idea when he says, do not use vain repetitions. Some people take that idea, well, I, sh I should just keep quiet in my prayer because I say the same word over and over again as a filler. Or because I say, uh, Father God, as I, as I begin to, to, to build my thoughts, and I, and I, have, I use a, I, I am a repetitive in my prayer as a filler thought, I should just stop praying. God's not speaking about those repetitions. God's not speaking about that because God understands it's not about how well you speak. God is not, and listen, listen, God is not an abracadabra God that you compile the right list of words and you make it sound all nice and pretty and you put a bow on top and God looks and says, wow, that was a well thought out, well executed prayer. Your words were spot on. You ran through spell check before you, you prayed. <laughs> because of that, I'm going to give you the prayers of your heart. No, 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 no. God is not after the words of your lips. God is after the prayers of your heart. So he says, don't use vain repetitions. Let me tell you a little bit about this. Let me, I'm not gonna, uh, it's not up on the overhead because it doesn't necessarily need to be there. But in Mark, the 12th chapter, Jesus is, is warning. He, he, he's, he's giving the warning to his followers about religious leaders, about, about those who, who are, are, are religious, the ones that he was talking about praying loud on the corners. And he says, beware. Mark, the 12th chapter. If you want to look it up later, you can. Mark the 12th chapter, the 40th verse. He says, beware. They shamelessly cheat widows out of their property and then pretend, listen, and then pretend to be pious by making long prayers in public. You see, God's not talking about filler words. He's not talking about gathering your thoughts. What he's talking about is if you're trying to pray and you look at there and you're making long prayers, you're repeating yourself over and over and over again so that somebody next to you says, wow. That's a prayer. I can't pray. You're praying to please man. The Bible tells us you'll have your reward. Fine. Great. People might look at you and say, wonderful. That's a righteous man. But what does God think about you? It doesn't matter what man thinks about you. God's not after the long, drawn out, repetitive prayers so that somebody might think that you're pious or righteous. God's after the heart and the desire of your heart. He's after the prayers of your heart, not the words out of your mouth. So he says... Don't use the vain repetitions. Don't pray extended periods of time just so many. If you want to pray for hours, praise God. You ought to pray for hours. Get down on your face. Hey, Jesus prayed in the garden until the disciples all fell asleep. And then he kicked them in the foot and said, get up and pray. So I'm not saying that your prayers should be short. What I am saying is that your prayers should be directed from the heart, not out of the mind. So Jesus, God's desire for you is to listen to the prayers of your heart. Put, let's put up Matthew, the, the, the sixth chapter, the seventh verse, one more time. Let's put that up. I want to show you something. He says, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think, say think. think. Look to the person to your, to your left or your right and say think. Look to the person next. They think. One more time, let's say it. I want you to remember that word, think, okay? They think they will be heard, okay? I want to show you an interesting thought that John takes us to here in the Word of God. And John... In the book of 1 John, if you want to turn there with me, you can. Let's go to 1 John in the 5th chapter. Remember, we're, we're, think, we're holding on to that word, think. 1 John in the 5th chapter. 1 John, 5th chapter. We're talking about when you pray. The heathens think they will be heard for their many words. Listen to what 1 John says. Listen to what John, is, the author, writes to us. He says, now verse number 14, Now this is the confidence... I love that word, confidence. Confidence has, says, listen, we can stand up and we can stand tall because we know that something is about to happen. 
So he says, for this is the confidence that we have in him, speaking of God, that if we ask anything according to his will, we think he hears us. No, that's not what it says. It says if we ask anything according to his will, we hope he hears us. No. It says if we ask anything according to his will, what happens? He hears us. But we're not done there. Listen to this. Let's go to verse number 15. And if we think, no. And if we hope that he hears us. No, 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 no. You see, John tells us, he says, and if we know, look at your neighbor and say no. no. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know, say it again one more time, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. You see, so here Jesus gives the example that the heathens, they, they have long, drawn-out, repetitive prayers that men might look upon them and say, wow, how great and wonderful is they, are they. They think they hear from God, but you and I, when we go before the Lord with humility, when we go before the Lord with genuine intentions in that secret place of our hearts, when we go before the Lord and we pray from the heart, the desires of our heart for his will to be done, his kingdom to come, guess what? The Bible tells us that we have confidence and that we know that he hears us. You want your prayers to be answered? Go before the Lord with humility. Humility says, God, it's not about my control. God, it's not about my gain. God, it's not about me. It's about you. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. You want to have prayers answered and heard? God, I go before you in the secret place. Does that mean that you can't pray in public? Does that mean that you can't pray with fellows? No. Corporate prayer is needed. We, the body of Christ, need to come together and pray together. But we should go before the Lord in our secret place as well and shed the distractions of the world and go before the Lord with genuine intentions. And three, today, we ought to go before God. When we go before the Lord, when we pray, pray with our hearts, not our heads. It's not about the words. It's not about how eloquent we speak. Listen, if you've ever prayed or if you've ever heard Pastor Deborah pray, nobody's a pr good prayer. The fact of the matter is you might have stood next to somebody who prayed very well and you thought, well, I, j I just can't do it. I I Don't shortchange what God has for you because of what somebody else said. Because God is not after the eloquency of your speech. He's after the prayer of your heart. And in conclusion, let's just put up Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse number eight. Just as a final thought, Jesus says, therefore, do not be like them. Whenever we see therefore in the Bible, we know that it's there for a reason because of what I just said. Because when you pray, because when you pray, because when you pray, Jesus says, because of those thoughts, don't be like the people that stand on the corner hoping to please men. That's great. You might get it. You might please man. But hey, listen, you know what? It's not about what man thinks of us. It's about what God thinks about us. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. Did you guys get something out of the Word this morning? I want to ask you to just give me a moment more of your attention. Church isn't out. You've only been in church for an hour and five minutes. Wow, this is Pastor Luke. Holy cow, this is like the first time ever. For those of you who haven't heard me, man, I'm notorious for going late. Today, no. But I want to ask you a question. I want, to, I want to ask you a favor first. Don't get up. Don't walk around. Give me a moment more of your attention. Let me ask you a question. Very important. You know, it would be a shame for us to have uh, praise and worship, to hear a wonderful message from the word, and, and to leave this place without giving you the opportunity to examine your eternal life with God. So I want to ask you this question today. Wherever you're seated, whether you're in the Love Rock Cafe or you're in the, in the outer foyer or you're in here today, I want to ask you this question. I want you to examine your heart. If you were to leave this place today and you were to die, heaven forbid, that was the case, but if you were to die, would you find yourself in heaven or would you find yourself in hell? It's a relatively simple question, but you know, the fact of the matter is, is that nobody's going to know that answer except you and God. So why don't we go over some of the thoughts that you might have had? You know, you might say, well, Pastor, look, I, I sure hope I get to heaven. I sure want to get there. I, I sure think I'm, I I'm going to go. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you can't hope or think or, or wish your way into heaven? Like you think you can, you think you can, that God's going to look on you and say, wow, they wanted it so bad that I'm going to give it to them. Nowhere in the word of God will you find it because you hope, you think, or you want your way to heaven that you're going to get in there. Hey, you might say, well, you know, Pastor Luke, I don't know that hell is real. I'm not sure about its existence. I'm not sure about all this heaven and hell thing. Hey, listen, it doesn't matter if you believe in it or not. It's like saying I don't believe in semi-trucks. 
You go and stand on the slow lane of the freeway, lo and behold, you're going to meet a semi-truck face to face. Hell is a very real place. Heaven is a very real place. And I love you enough. I respect you enough. Hey, listen, I honor you enough to not beat around the bush, but tell you like it is and tell you the truth. Do you know you can't get to heaven because you were baptized or christened as a baby? Because your parents took you to church on Christmas and on Easter? Because you went to Sunday school or Sabbath school or catechism classes? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you'll find your way into heaven because of those things. Hey, but, but Pastor Luke, you know, all my life my parents told me you're a Christian. I proclaim to be a Christian. Did you know nowhere in the Bible where you find that you can get to heaven because you call yourself a Christian? That's like saying, I'm going to go to the beach, I'm going to go sit in the ocean, and I'm going to, don't let this distract you. Pay attention. Like saying, I'm going to go sit in the ocean, I'm going to go sit in the water and call myself a fish. Nowhere in the Word of God can you find, or nowhere will you find that you're going to be a Christian because you call yourself a Christian. That's like saying, I'm going to be a fish because you sit in the water. Nowhere will you ever become a fish. You'll be a soggy person, and that's it. You know, nowhere in the Bible will you find that because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, that you're going to get your way to heaven. That by default, that means that I guess I'm going to go to heaven. Listen, nowhere in the Word of God will you find that you're going to get your way into heaven because of those things. It's just not that way. Let me, let, me, let me love you enough to tell you the truth. You might think in your heart, you might think in your mind that I'm going to go to heaven because I'm a good person. Pastor Luke, I've never cheated on my taxes. I, I, don't, I don't steal. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I don't drive over the speed limit on the freeway. I, I live a good life. Hey, listen, let me tell you something. Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that because you're a good person, because you live a good life, because you give to charitable organizations, because you've never robbed a bank or 7-Eleven, because you live a good lifestyle that you're going to get into heaven. Nowhere will you find that in the Word of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. The fact of the matter is, is that nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. It's just not that way. Hey, but Pastor Luke, I got a card in my wallet that says I'm a member to a church. I served in the youth ministry or I helped in the children's ministry. Pastor Luke, I've got a Jesus tattoo on my arm or on my back. Doesn't that mean something? Nowhere in the Bible will you find that because you served in church, because you've got a card, or a card that says you're a member of a church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you've memorized John 3, 16 or a few other verses that you're going to get into heaven. The devil in hell knows the word of God. He's studied the word of God. He's not getting into heaven. The devil and the demons in hell know who Jesus Christ is, yet they're not going to find their way into heaven. So it's not about knowing who God is. There's more to it than that. As a matter of fact, let me show it to you. In the book of John, in the third chapter, you can read it for yourself. A man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he asks him, what must I do to get into heaven? Let me tell you a little bit about Nicodemus. The Bible tells us that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, a leader of the Jews. That means in our day and age that Nicodemus was the equivalent of a Ph.D. He had given his young life, dedicated his young life to studying and memorizing the Word of God. Nicodemus had more scripture memorized than you and I could even think imaginable. Nicodemus taught in the temple. Nicodemus gave to the poor. He did all the right things. And you would think that when Nicodemus goes to Jesus and he asks him, what must I do to get into heaven? That Jesus would look at Nicodemus and say, wow, you just keep on going and you just be an example to everybody else. Pat on the back. But no. Jesus says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Now you've heard that word. You think, oh man, you're going to go there. Listen, Hollywood, popular culture, society, they've made a mockery out of that term. But let me tell you something. I don't care what they say or what they mean. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing in the, in the intentions of God. It means that you've given God all of your heart. Hey, listen, you've given God all of your life. You see, God's not after a mental knowledge or a carnal, a mental ascent towards him, a carnal knowledge of who he is. God's after all of your heart. God's after all of your life. Let me prove it to you again in the book of, in the book of Revelation. The last book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is speaking to the church, the believers. And he says to them, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot. I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa. Shocking statement. Designed to get your attention. And what Jesus Christ is saying is that only lukewarm Christians will be rejected and ejected from the kingdom of God. Well, what does lukewarm mean? In terms of your relationship with Jesus Christ, lukewarm means that you're up and you're down, you're in and you're out, you're floating around, you're bouncing between the church and the world, church and the world, doing a little bit of your own thing, doing a little bit of God's thing, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Jesus Christ says if that's you, if you're living lukewarm, you are deceived in thinking that you're going to make it into heaven. So what do we do? I want to give each and every one of you the opportunity in just a moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to count to three. I'm going to smack my hand on the Bible and I'm going to go one, two, and I'm going to go three, just like that. In just a moment when I do that, I want to encourage you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by raising your hand is you're saying, you know what, Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all of my life. 
I want to give him all of my heart. You know, the fact of the matter is, is that you can't get to God your way. You can't get to God my way. Hey, we can't get to God or heaven some well-meaning church committee's way or some author's way. The only way we can go is through Jesus Christ. And he said that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And when I say to raise your hand and to acknowledge that you want to give him all of your heart, all of your life, you say, Pastor Luke, I don't think I can do that. I'm going to be embarrassed. Somebody's going to see me. Hey, listen, I'm not going to embarrass you. But even if you were embarrassed because somebody saw you, which you might be, get over it. Because you're in a welcome and warm and loving place. What better place to confess Jesus Christ than this place right here? Don't miss out on your opportunity because you were too embarrassed. The fact of the matter is that Jesus Christ says that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. So don't miss out on your opportunity today because of embarrassment. Let's get over it and go forward for God. Today is the day of your salvation. Don't wait any longer. Who should raise their hands if you've never given him all of your heart? If you've never given him all of your life, in a moment when I count to three, get your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down. Who should raise their hands in this place? If you're not sure, maybe you did this as a child or you, you don't know. Listen, if you've never made a public profession of your faith, in a moment when I count to three, get your hand up. Stop playing around. Stop waiting on God. And let's go forward today. Today is the day of your salvation. And finally, today, who should get their hand up? If you've been living lukewarm, if you've been doing your own thing instead of God's thing, and been running from God instead of to God, today is the day for you to go hot for Jesus Christ. Let's make today the day of your salvation. Don't wait any longer. Don't walk out of this place today without making sure that's a gamble on your eternal life that you can't afford to make. So in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to clap my hands if that's you. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down, and we'll go forward for God. Today, if that's you, your salvation is now in the name of Jesus. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in the house today. One, two, three. Where are you at? Four, five. I see you. Six, seven. All right. Let me see your hands. Eight. Thank you. Nine. I see you back there. Uh, nine wise people. Anybody else? If I haven't seen you, ten. Okay, I got you, brother. Ten wise people. I see somebody pointing over here. I see somebody pointing. Eleven. Okay, I see you. Another one. Okay, twelve. I see you. And in the, in the family rooms, do we have anybody in the family rooms? In the foyer? Uh, I see those. I've got you guys already back there. I think we're at eleven. Anybody else? Eleven wise people. All right, twelve. I see you right there, brother, up front. Twelve wise people. Anybody else in the house today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. I wonder if I should. Come on, get your hand up today. Let's stop playing games with God, and let's go forward for God. I see your hand. All right, 13, I see you right there. 13 wise people. Anybody else in the place today? Say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on, let's go forward for God today. 14, I see you back there. 14 wise people. Where are you at, number 15? Say, man, I think I should. I, oh. Come on, if that's you, get your hand up. Let's go forward for God. Anybody else today? Anybody else today? This is your moment. Anybody else today? I don't, want to, I don't want to miss out. Come on. Stop playing games with God and get your hands up. You're in this place and God's speaking to you right now. Where are you at? Get your hand up so we can go forward for God. Anybody else? Well, praise God for 14 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. From the front to the back, from the foyer to the Love Rock Cafe, if you raised your hand in there, put that burrito down, whatever, get over here. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand. We're going to stand together. We're going to sing a song. If you raised your hand, you said you wanted to give him all of your heart. You said you want to give him all of your life. In a moment, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. If you're in the family rooms, if you're in the back row, it doesn't matter. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair and let us help you. Let us pray with you today. If that's you, come on down. Come on. You can come. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. And come give him your heart. Come give him your life. If that's you, come on. You can come. Come on. If that's you, come on. Come on. From the front, from the back, if that's you, come on down. From the family rooms, wherever you're at, it's not too late. You come. Get down. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come on down. Come on. You can come. Come on. Come on. Listen, guys, I want to tell you something. You're not going to a funeral today 
You're going to new life. You're going to a birth celebration, your new life. Today is the first day of the rest of your life, and here's what I want to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This is Pastor Dave Simmons right over here. You see Pastor Dave waving at you? Pastor Dave's going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer. Pastor Dave, let me tell you something about Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is the nicest guy you're going to meet. It's sickening how nice Pastor Dave is. It really is. Not a mean, mo not a mean bone in his body. He's going to take you right over there. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come in your heart, come in your life. He's going to give you some free literature, some things that our church wrote that will help you go forward with your relationship with God to get you strong in the ways of God. And he's going to invite you. One more thing he's going to do. He's going to invite you into a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainer. You know, you go to the gym, you see a personal trainer that help you build those muscles and get you strong and focus in on things. Well, we have spiritual personal trainers, a friend, somebody that will meet with you right before service. They'll buy you a cup of coffee for 20 minutes or, or so, and they'll teach you some things about the Word of God for a few weeks and get you strong in the ways of the Lord so that you don't go back to where you came from, okay? So if you guys would just go right over there with Pastor Dave.